Welcome to a new episode of TGI Rabbit MQ. My name is Gerhard, and in today's episode, we talk about how to run RabbitMQ on Kubernetes reliably. In the previous episode, we looked at how to get started, the simplest possible RabbitMQ on Kubernetes. In today's episode, we take that further. We deploy a managed Kubernetes cluster across three availability zones. We deploy a three node RabbitMQ cluster, one node in each availability zone. And then with multiple publishers and consumers running, we observe how well our RabbitMQ handles the following scenarios. A RabbitMQ upgrade, a Kubernetes upgrade, as well as the loss of one availability zone, two availability zones, and the complete loss of an entire region. We start with a local copy of the RabbitMQ TGI repository. And in season one, episode six directory, you will find a list of make targets for all the things that we do in this episode. If you want to follow along, this makes it very easy. The first target that we run is make Kubernetes, which in this case creates a Kubernetes cluster in Google Cloud. Because we don't specify a zone, this is a regional cluster. It's created in region Europe West 2. And we say number of nodes 2, meaning that in every single zone, we'll have two worker nodes created. Three minutes later, the cluster has been successfully created. Let's take a look and see what exactly has been created for us. In a split pane, I run make canines and Ncurses interface for Kubernetes. This makes it really easy to take a look at all deployments, interact with them, maybe list all the nodes and also describe a node. So we're looking at one of the nodes here. We can see all the labels. We can see uh, the state. We can see what pods run on it, how many resources they use, all the events. It's that easy. Now that we have a Kubernetes cluster, let's deploy RabbitMQ. We source env to get bash completion. The target that we'll be running is make RabbitMQ, which applies all the YAML in the Kubernetes directory. And out of all these things that get created, the most interesting one is the stateful set, which is our RabbitMQ cluster definition. All the other things are either dependencies of the stateful set or additions to the stateful set. So what does Kubernetes do with all this configuration? What does it look like? Can we see our RabbitMQ cluster? In canines, we can see that RabbitMQ0 is just being created. If we take a look at the stateful set and describe the stateful set, we can see that we will end up with three replicas and the current state is waiting on the first one. The other interesting thing that we can see here is the exact RabbitMQ version that we'll be running. If we switch back to the pods view and we tail the logs of RabbitMQ0, we will catch it just as it's finished booting. And while the second RabbitMQ node is being created, I'm wondering if we can access RabbitMQ management. For that, we check the service. We see that it already has an external IP assigned, so we're good to go. And while you could copy paste the external IP address and add the management port in your browser, this is another way of doing the same thing. The username is your local system user, which was set during make RabbitMQ, and the password it's tgir s 01 e 6 Two nodes are already up and available. The third one just came up, and in less than two minutes, we have a three node RabbitMQ cluster ready for some publishers and consumers. Make RabbitMQ clients is exactly what we want. It deploys a bunch of publishers and consumers, which are as reliable as it gets. And if we take a look at how this consumer is configured, in Kate's deployment.consumer, we can see that it's using quorum queues, which is the most reliable replicated queue that RabbitMQ has. We're using consumer acknowledgements. The QS or the messages in flight is set to 100. The connection recovery is enabled by default in perftest. And as for the publishers, they are configured the same. The only difference is publisher confirms. You can check out the configuration. It's right next to deployment.consumer. And within 10 seconds, we can see that we'll have six consumers and six publishers 
two of each per node, and we can see that they're already publishing messages into RabbitMQ. There's our core MQ. We notice that the queue leader is running on RabbitMQ2 with followers on RabbitMQ1 and RabbitMQ0. Everything being set, let's upgrade RabbitMQ. Within seconds, the last node that was created in the stateful set is the first node that will be updated. This is one of the properties of stateful sets. The interesting thing about this node that's being updated is that that's where the queue leader was running. So that means that one of the queue followers will need to become the new queue leader. In this case, that is RabbitMQ0. And while this happens almost instantly, something doesn't look right. Actually, a few things don't look right. For starters, we have no message backlog. Does that mean that we have lost messages? Also, why is the publishing rate lower than what used to be only 10 seconds ago? If I put these side by side, you'll see exactly what I mean. So we didn't lose messages. We were publishing at 600 messages per second. So what happened? Well, RabbitMQ2 went away. That's what happened. And a third of the metrics that we were aggregating were coming from RabbitMQ2, including all the queue metrics, like for example, the message backlog. Now that RabbitMQ2 is being updated and it's no longer running, we don't get those metrics. Not only that, but because those metrics were stored in memory, even when RabbitMQ2 comes back, we still won't have them. This highlights the importance of using RabbitMQ Prometheus and storing RabbitMQ metrics outside of RabbitMQ. This will be a future episode, but for now, let's come back to our RabbitMQ upgrade. After RabbitMQ2 gets updated, it's RabbitMQ1's turn. In Management UI, if we refresh the page and zoom in on the nodes, we see that RabbitMQ2 has already been updated to 389. RabbitMQ1, we don't know because it's being updated. And RabbitMQ0 is still 388. About a minute later, RabbitMQ0 gets updated as well. And we have updated all three nodes in the cluster to 389. Within these three minutes, the producers and consumers, we can see that they have not restarted, none of them. They continued consuming messages, publishing messages. They're able to reconnect gracefully as RabbitMQ nodes were coming and going. And all this time, the message backlog went up and then eventually down. And within a few minutes, we end up with a 389 RabbitMQ cluster with three nodes, all consumers and producers healthy, and things went pretty smoothly. Let's try a Kubernetes upgrade next and see how that goes. We make a Kubernetes upgrade. Yes, we do want to continue. While this is running, let's take a look at what's happening from an IS perspective. We see that two new instances have been created in zone B. One is staging, one is already running. And the reason why it's two new instances is because we configured this Kubernetes cluster to create two surge instances during an upgrade. And we have set max unavailable upgrade to zero, meaning that no running instance will be stopped until the new instances are running. While one zone is being upgraded, we can expect to see double the number of instances running. From a Kubernetes perspective, we can see that one of the 117 nodes is getting ready to be stopped. We have one 118 node and the second one only just appeared. Five new pods get scheduled on the second 118 node. Seven are already running on the first 118 node. And all this time, notice how the messages in the, in the queue backlog have been slowly draining. And besides publishing and consuming never stopping during the zone upgrade, we also noticed that RabbitMQ2, the node that was running in zone B, got restarted 20 seconds ago. During the first zone upgrade, RabbitMQ behaved exactly as expected. What about the rest of the zones? The upgrade in the second zone goes smoothly, RabbitMQ0 goes away and comes back as expected. And so does the last zone. 
where RabbitMQ1 is running. All this time, our workload behaved as expected. The message backlog grew and shrunk, and at any given point in time, only a third of our clients were being rescheduled. Two thirds were continuing work unaffected. As one zone was being upgraded, the pods running on that zone had to be rescheduled onto new nodes. This would take seconds in the case of clients, which are stateless, and up to a minute for RabbitMQ nodes, which take a bit longer to come up and resynchronize with the rest of the cluster. We must not forget about persistent disks, which do take a while to be detached from one instance and get reattached to a different instance. All things considered, within 12 minutes, we performed a full Kubernetes cluster upgrade across all three zones, and RabbitMQ handled the disruption flawlessly, both the clients and the broker. But what happens during an unexpected event such as losing all the instances running in one zone. How does RabbitMQ handle the scenario where everything in one zone gets powered off? Hard, brutal, unexpected. If we delete all the instances, even Kubernetes takes a minute or two to realize what's going on. We can see that one of the RabbitMQ nodes is already offline, but according to Kubernetes, the nodes are still running. If we look at the instances from an IS perspective, we can see that both instances that run in zone A are stopping. And sure enough, the RabbitMQ1 pod is initializing, but where? There's no instance in that availability zone where this pod can be scheduled. The clients got rescheduled on the other two availability zones almost instantly, and because there is no strict requirement as to where consumers and producers run, other than ensuring they're evenly spread across zones, combined with the fact that the majority of the nodes are still available, publishing and consuming messages continues as if nothing happened. Within two minutes, the cloud instances are automatically recreated, and the pod where the RabbitMQ1 node runs can be scheduled in that availability zone. 10 seconds later, RabbitMQ boots, and five seconds later, it joins the cluster and it's able to continue as if nothing happened. If you look at when the incident started and when it ended, we can see that within three minutes, everything got recreated, everything became healthy automatically with no intervention on our part. And because we always had a majority of RabbitMQ nodes running, publishing and consuming messages were unaffected. Feeling confident would lead the majority of zones and we observe how RabbitMQ behaves, but as well as how the clients behave. What do they do when the majority of RabbitMQ nodes are unavailable? Does the cluster even work? Let's find out. The cluster kind of works. We can access it via the management UI. We can see that one node is running. We can see that there is a queue, but there are no channels. There is no publishing of messages or no consuming of messages. And the consumer counter, which we see there's two consumers apparently, these will be the consumer connections that abruptly went away and the counter has not been cleared yet. If we look at the queue, we can see that the leader is running on RabbitMQ0, but because only a minority of members are online, meaning one out of three, the queue will refuse to make any progress. Even though it does have 25,000 messages, nothing will happen with these until at least one more member joins the leader. Similar to what we've seen before, within three minutes, all instances across all availability zones get recreated. And in this case, publishing and consuming can resume because the majority of nodes are online. If we look at how close apart the two nodes started, we can see that RabbitMQ2 started six seconds before RabbitMQ1. So in this case, both nodes started almost at the same time. Having saved the best for last, let's see what happens when we lose an entire region. How does RabbitMQ and the clients handle everything being deleted? All six instances across all three zones. 
Unsurprisingly, the RabbitMQ management is not working. And according to the Kubernetes master, which is not a VM that we can delete, none of the eight nodes are ready. Nothing is running in this cluster except the Kubernetes master. Less than two minutes later, we see that all cloud instances are running. And if we query the Kubernetes API, we can see nodes becoming ready two by two, which matches the instances being created in the different availability zones. Consumers and publishers are the first to start, but they keep crashing because there's no RabbitMQ nodes to connect to. If we look at one of the consumer logs, we notice a temporary failure in name resolution, which means that the service reliable rabbit public cannot be resolved. While we could handle this exception, the simplest thing in this case is just to let it crash and have Kubernetes reschedule them. And like clockwork, three minutes later, everything is back. The RabbitMQ cluster, the publishers, the consumers, even the queue backlog, 30,000 messages, it's still there. With no intervention on our part, in three minutes, everything got restored. If that's not impressive, I don't know what is. And now that I've said that, there will be something even more impressive. Continuous active rebalancing of all connections in the cluster. If we look at socket descriptors for RabbitMQ0, we see it has zero, which means there's no connections. RabbitMQ1 has four connections and RabbitMQ2 has 20 connections. It would have been beyond impressive if this happened automatically without me needing to go into the deployments and manually restarting both consumers and publishers so that the connections would be randomly distributed across all three nodes in the cluster. What I want you to take away from this is that as impressive as this was, it can always be made better. And that's something that we keep in mind with every RabbitMQ release that we make available. And now, as we approach the end of the episode, we go back to where this started, which is issue 13 opened by Omar. And these are the questions which we had. I feel that we have answered two to six reasonably well. and We even have demonstrated what happens in these scenarios. The only question which we haven't answered is what are good liveness and redness probes? For this, we open in the Kubernetes directory, the stateful set YAML file, and we search for readiness. In these comments, Omar, you'll find your answer. And the TLDR is that based on everything that I know, I don't recommend liveness probes. I only recommend startup and readiness probes. And this captures why I currently think that. There are other interesting comments in this file. Have a read and let me know what you think. Talking about reading, we have recently put out this blog post, which I highly encourage you to read as it will add more detail to what you have watched today and what you have seen in the previous episode. And even though some of these topics I haven't even mentioned, as you continue on your RabbitMQ and Kubernetes journey, it will help you tremendously to at least be aware of these things. And with that being said, thank you for watching. See you next time.